Hello, world. You are listening to Strategic on your window to all things security and foreign affairs. It is Thursday, February the twenty sixth, two thousand and fifteen, episode five. I'm your host, John Bruni, and with me in the studio today is co-host and Sage International Associate David Olney from the University of Adelaide, and uh, Strategic on producer Alicia Moreau. Good evening to you both. Good, Good evening, evening, John. Alicia, what do we see in the news today? Well, California train crash was an accident, lawyer for the truck says. In Ventura, California, a lawyer for the truck who's a, a lawyer for the driver whose truck was hit by a California commuter train in a wreck that injured 50 people said on Wednesday the crash was an accident and that his client left the scene only to try and find help. Weeks spending to show Japan's consumers unconvinced by Bank of Japan's stimulus. In Tokyo, Japanese households cut spending further and retail sales fell for the first time in seven months in January. Data on Friday is likely to show a sign the central bank's radical stimulus has yet to convince consumers that inflation will hold. Ukraine heaps on economic pressure as central bank confuses. Truce takes hold. Kiev, Ukraine. Ukraine came under greater economic pressure after unexpectedly banning most currency trading and then abruptly reversing course, wreaking havoc on the Hvinia, just as the truce in the east took hold on Wednesday with no combat fatalities reported. The US changes charges three with conspiring to support Islamic State in New York. Three men were charged on Wednesday with conspiring to support Islamic State, including two who planned to travel to Syria to fight on behalf of the radical group, U.S. authorities said. The U.S. Senate votes to clear path for security agenda agency funding. Washington. The Senate on Wednesday moved to advert a partial su- shutdown of the U.S. domestic security agency this weekend, voting to clear the way for a funding bill free of contentious immigration issues. On Bush turf, Obama blames immigration woes on Republicans. Miami. President Barack Obama on Wednesday told Latinos that Republicans were to blame for holding up changes to U.S. immigration laws, urging them to hold Republicans accountable for the problems in the 2016 presidential election. Back to you, John. (laughs) <clears throat> okay, Alicia. Now, with regard to the naming of the Ukrainian currency, I think it is the Hervnya. David? The, <laughs> the Hervnya? Hervnya. Why don't we just say the Ukrainian currency? I think Actually, we'll go that, with that. Yeah, I think that that would be a much easier sell for everyone concerned. But anyway, I, I mean, if you had a currency that was going to be so difficult to say, why do you not convert to something a little easier like the dollar? Because it guaranteed they would have something that was uniquely Ukrainian, which has now turned out to be a major problem because no one wants anything uniquely u- Ukrainian because there's no certainty left in their economy. Yeah, that is true. That and is true. trying to buy everything in euros, dollars and rubles is just making for a wild exchange market that will allow for black market and criminal speculation on currency. So someone wheels and deals in dollars or euros and then trades it on to the Russian mafia in rubles to then trade back into euros or dollars later. All you're doing is providing an opportunity essentially to launder money through a war zone. Mm -hmm. So Japan's stimulus package and uh, people not having necessarily the confidence in spending the yen on cool things and gadgets. I mean, I find this is... Incredible. I mean, what's the world coming to? Well, the Japanese don't buy their own products. They save. This is why a Japanese company was able to buy a very large chunk of Toll Group. This is this is an extraordinary idea because here in Australia, saving and saving in a very organised and deliberate fashion is not necessarily something you would say is par for the course. I mean, what is with the Japanese and saving? It seems to be a big historical thing that really after the dramas of Reconstruction after World War II, the idea that you've always got to be ready to look after yourself seems to have become so deeply insinuated into Japanese culture that when you give the Japanese a tax break, they don't spend it, they save it. Mm. 
when you tell them things are better, take an extra half day off of work. Go do something fun with your family. They sit at home and save the money. Mm-hmm. It's, I think you know, it's really now 20 years of economic malaise with small interruptions of overexcitement for underachievement. So, so, I mean, from my perspective, when I look at the Japanese economy and what I think of the Japanese economy and the degree of stagflation and various other things that have really bedeviled uh, Japan over the last 20-odd years, it seems a permanent, almost institutionalized part of the economic structure. There's a systemic funk that they just can't seem to get over. And in a sense, you know, as a leading light in the Asia-Pacific – Again, talking strategically and thinking outside and just extending on this, I mean, have the Americans put too much stock in the whole idea of pivoting toward Asia if you've got a ramshackle kind of Japanese economy sitting on the edge of China that is kind of booming but also looking very fragile at the same time? Well, what, what, is, the, what is the whole situation going on in, in, that, in that sense? I wonder if we think of it in terms of an American pivot, that there was an economic pivot long before there was a strategic pivot, that throughout Japan's rebuilding after World War II, America America takes on the role of importer of last resort. So to kickstart the Japanese economy from the 50s onwards, the Japanese can get products into America, and almost anything they make can be sold, Eventually, the Japanese economy is doing well. The Americans move on and do a similar thing for the Korean economy to ensure that's rebuilt. By the late 1980s, it's obvious that China is where stuff can be made cheaply, and America stops being the last importer and instead becomes, well, we'll buy what we want, and what we want is cheap stuff. So it's almost like America transitioning from a support role to a partnership role with Japan also marks the beginning of the end of the Japanese economy. Which then leads us to something that we'll discuss a little bit further um, uh, in a moment, but that is multilateralism, things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. <clears throat> is this like America and Japan's last, ga- last gasp f- of, for, for relevance in the, in the world, uh, trying to combine their whatever's left of their economic might in order for them to uh, assume power, in a sense. Well, let's break this down into chunks and do a comparison. If we look demographically, America is constantly renewing itself with young people. Even if they come from somewhere different, they still end up American. Japan is running out of young people. If we look at it in terms of economic growth, America is a large internal market that will consume itself into oblivion, like us on credit. Japan saves, doesn't spend. So there's different things that can go wrong with the economy in the two places. There's a growing population that can always pull America out of problems. There's a diminishment of the size and vigour of the population in Japan that is going to have economic implications. So in a sense, the idea of counting America out of the game is always a mistake because the whole point of America is to constantly reinvent Whereas it's Japan that keeps imagining all we really want to do is get back our economic status from the late 80s, early 90s. That is a time past and a society that's past its prime. Yeah. I think that there's going to be some really tough and very interesting times ahead in Northeast Asia uh, with regard to Japan and, and how it sees itself um, as, as a, an instrumental cog in, in the Asia-Pacific region. But uh, over to you, Alicia. I think you have something to say with regard to what's in the news for the week. Well, dominating the headlines this week was the issue regarding food labelling laws in Australia, following the uh, Nana's frozen berries hepatitis A scare. Food security will be increasingly of interest to people as global supply chains fully replace local food production. So how safe is our food in this brave new world of multilateral trade deals, often involving countries that have lax or non-existent basic levels of quality control? I think it's a danger to society. Truly, you know, we just heard uh, in the nightly news uh, four people in Sydney who went off to a cafe 
um, to eat some sort of fish dish, ended up getting some food poisoning as a consequence of uh, having, I don't know what the, the correct term for it is, but it looked like um, some sort of alien-style disease. I don't know what it is, but it was a can of tuna packed with this stuff. Mm-hmm. So four people have been rushed off the hospital with regard to um, their, their, their plight. Um, uh, the cafe in question had stopped selling the food once they realized that their customers were getting sick. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, well, this is just, you know, this is the future. Uh, there, w- there was a time when in Australia we actually took pride in having food um, being investigated by independent authorities on a regular basis to prevent at least the worst outbreaks of botulism or various other stomach bugs as a consequence of serving tainted food. But because we're going down this globalized, multilateral path uh, of economic development, we don't seem to be having the same sense of, well, okay, if we do this, how do we assure that at the end of the food chain, there is that quality assurance? Because if you don't have that quality assurance, um, you'll, you'll end up having a whole heap of issues. David? We invested an awful lot of time, money and effort in public health to make food, food production and food distribution safe. And the terrible thing of doing something like that and dealing with other countries who did the same thing at the same time. For example, middle of 19th century, the idea of public health, public hygiene leaps into the modern mind and suddenly people live longer and they're healthier. Mm. And this was deliberately taught and spread across much of the world and a large number of countries bought the cost of public health and food meeting the standards of public health. And then we got to the race of the bottom of how cheap can everything be. Mm. And you can make a, you know, a safer car to a, a cost standard. That's possible. But making safe food to a cost standard is actually very difficult because of all the variables that go with food production. So because we made the assumption that we learned about public health, that everyone else did, and that everyone else will invest in it, well, we forget part of what makes food here so expensive is not just that wages in Australia are high, but the cost of public health is high. Mm. So the first place you skimp to bring the cost of food down is on public health. And in a sense, labelling on food doesn't need to say where it came from. It needs to say what public health issues don't they take into consideration to enable them to produce this so cheaply. Okay, so if Tony Abbott is correct and he's going to try to impose a cost-effective way of recreating food labelling in Australia. Because, uh, honestly, if anyone were going to the local food land or Woolworths or Coles and they were conscientious enough to have a look at the back of a label of something, the kind of contradictory information on said label is, is just amazing. So you really don't know, well, where does X come from? Where does Y come from? I mean, uh, an example would be pork. If you're a consumer of pork products, you will see a label on pork that says um, predominantly Australian or, may, or product of Australia with overseas ingredients. The overseas ingredients aren't necessarily clearly dem- uh, displayed, uh, nor, is the, uh, nor is the destination of those, where those overseas ingredients came from. So you end up having a whole heap of other embedded issues here in terms of your control over the quality of the end product of your food. It's, yeah. The labelling ends up being a nightmare. If we take your pork example, the foreign ingredient can be the really nifty spices that make something taste yummy that we cannot grow in Australia. So you know, the labelling that can allow you to put cloves and cardamom in something is also the labelling that can allow you to misrepresent where the majority of the protein in the product comes from. Yeah, but surely we can actually... We have the technology in Australia to put cardamom in various spices you know, in our own pork products. Well, so we can put it in, but we can't necessarily grow it. Again, you're going to import that. So you've got a case where part of global distribution and making global food is that you don't make the Australian ingredient version of something. You make the global version because that's what people have eaten and that's what people have want. So the problem is not just the simple thing of, you know, where a berry comes from. It's the whole idea of are we going to mix and match pieces from everywhere? Ideally, this is what makes the global economy go around. But until we have a conception of global public health that informs this, we're going to probably have people having a knee-jerk reaction and going, well, I'm not going to buy food from overseas. And then they're going to find out how difficult it is to buy just Australian food. 
Now, the uh, Prime Minister says <clears throat> that the cost of a comprehensive overhaul of Australia's food labelling standards would be high and that it's the responsibility of businesses not to poison their customers. I'm hearing the cicadas in the background. <laughs> it is the responsibility, the responsibility of business <laughs> not to poison their customers. Yes. Uh, isn't this a thing called Donoghue versus Stevenson and doesn't it rely on a court case? Someone yeah. actually has to find the remains of the snail in their ginger beer and go see their barrister? Mm, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Well, I don't know. If you like your protein in with your ginger beer, maybe it is. Oh, well. Anyway, let's move on to different topics, shall we? <laughs> Also dominating the headlines this week is the Abbott government's decision to deploy an extra 400 Australian soldiers to Iraq on a training mission to shore up the regime of Haider al-Abdi Abadi in Baghdad. Is this what it appears to be? Or does this latest Australian deployment signify a slow yet inexorable escalation in the West's war against ISIL? Okay, Dave, I'll go. Um, I reckon that this could very well be the thin edge of the wedge. I think that, you know, the Prime Minister of Australia has already indicated through leaked documents that uh, he's had enough of this ISIL mob and he's quite happy for Australia to declare, quote, unquote, unilateral war against ISIL. Now, that's something for the books. <laughs> but in the end, um, uh, maybe uh, you know, maybe he's going to get at least partially there by having put this new deployment in, because ultimately the airstrikes are having an effect, but they're only having an effect so far as we're, we've got legitimate targets to bomb. Uh, the next par- portion of this, this exercise in getting rid of ISIL from the Middle East, or the map, from the map of the Middle East, is to actually put boots on the ground. And the training mission, quote unquote, could very well be a robust training mission where people are training the Iraqi military, but also directing them and perhaps having a hand in trying to get out, go after the bad guys themselves. What do you think? I think the idea of an expanded training mission is the most polite way to cover just about everything under the sun. Yeah. <laughs> it also, actually, we don't know what the training mission really means. Mm. Who are we going to train? Are we going to train more of the regular Iraqi army who... Initially, we're doing a very bad job of fighting back, mm-hmm. are now doing a tolerable job of fighting back, and with the amount of energy and effort being invested in them, should start doing a much better job. Are we going to train local Iraqi National Guard units who are wedded to their local environment, their local community, and fight, in a sense, more as a militia? Do we really want to train up local militias who can, five years from now, become the local equivalent of the gang in charge? Mm. Do we want to be responsible for a training mission that turns into the next justification for the fracturing of Iraq? One of the things that I'm really curious about is Iran's hand within Iraq proper. Now, a lot has been said with regard to America or the Obama administration reaching out to the Iranians to try to you know, have a rapprochement of sorts to, to break down the antagonism, the 30-year-plus antagonism between the United States and Iran. From a strategic perspective, that makes sense, but isn't that kind of suggesting that our almost immediate past enemies then also have access to having their Iraqi militias trained a la the U.S. and Australian special forces, which means that they become the most capable and it allows then the Iranians to have more control over the Iraqi, uh, well, Iraq doesn't really exist as it once did, but the, the Iraqi map? Do you guarantee, essentially, that a Shia state run by Iran is the only viable bit left? Because, again, our training mission, you would have to imagine, is going to be for the army proper or Sunni militias in areas where it's deemed they are the next front line, Mm. that we would not be invited to train Shia parts of Iraq. So is this a longer political view of if the place is going to destabilise anyway that the Shia majority make sure they can build a functional state at the end of the process. You know, to change direction ever so slightly, I got asked a question on New Zealand radio last night by a journalist whether New Zealand is looking at sending 143 you know, New Zealand defence personnel to Iraq for this training mission. And the journalist just asked very sensibly and calmly, what will happen if one of these New Zealand defence people is killed 
if they're grabbed and a week later beheaded or set alight on camera? Mm. Will that be the justification for kicking off a proper boots on the ground operation? So every extra Westerner ending up in Iraq on a training mission without clear agreements about why we're there, how we're there, what legal protections we have, when we can defend ourselves, when we can use weapons, has got to lead to just this getting potentially more and more out of control, which doesn't do anyone any good. It's, it seems to me, f- from what you say and from my own observations, that uh, Western policy in terms of the Middle East is just so flawed right now. I mean, I, I don't think it's ever been perfect, but it's never been as bad. And the, there is a kind of vacuum that exists at the moment where we just don't know how to put our foot right in in that in that hornet's nest, essentially. Uh, and then you've got the these the, this this subterranean war that's going on. You know, you've got the Saudis against the Iranians. You've got you know Iran trying to impose its its will on a broken Iraq. You've got this proxy war that ISIL represents. So you, you know, you've got some Saudi interests in there. You've got some Turkish interests in there. And, of course, ISIL itself is just, like, unbelievably horrid. But it serves a strategic purpose as well, and that is to keep the Kurds destabilized. It is a mess. It is an absolute mess. And what is so disturbing in this whole situation is that we talk about national interests and we talk about, the well, you just raised the issue that, you know, well, what happens if a Kiwi gets beheaded or an Aussie SAS guy gets captured and, and burnt alive and everything gets posted on YouTube or whatever? What, what, what is going to be the instinct? If it turns into then a full-scale war with events in Europe as they are, in, in events, economic events in, 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 um, in Asia, uh, this could be the thing that's going to break this, the, the, the camel's back, essentially, and pardon the pun. Yeah, mm. it, it looks like there's nothing about this that can get better. Mm. You know, essentially, since the quote-unquote Arab Spring, there is more political awareness, more potential of political mobilisation in the Middle East than there's probably ever been. There's more people looking for the West to put its feet wrong, mm. to make a mistake. And when we go in to enhance a training mission where there's not a clear sense... Okay, the New Zealanders are saying nine months to two years. They're trying to define how long they're going to be there. That's nice. But nine months to two years of doing what? And doing what for who to who? There's too many questions here that remain unanswered. Okay, one thing so far that is semi-intelligent is there was talk of, oh, if the New Zealanders are going, will the Australian-New Zealand contingent be under some sort of Anzac banner? And the nice thing is at least that's been left alone. We don't want to be there looking like some sort of imperial force with historical connotations from 1914 to 1918. We want to look like people who've been invited to help empower a population to protect themselves, defend their space, and retake space and people you know, from a hostile barbarian regime. But the likelihood of this being successful and leading to any kind of positive end I know we need to be engaged in the international community and look like we're helping, but I really can't see how sending the SAS and two commando to Iraq to train people who don't seem particularly committed to a fight that no one's running well, that crosses across multiple countries, can end in anything other than more highly skilled people wandering around with weapons, a clear sense of how to use them, Mm. and no clear purpose in mind. No, absolutely. Um, I I think that... uh we we should really give up on the idea that Iraq, what what is currently Iraq, is worth saving because Iraq was a construct of the Baathist Party under Saddam Hussein. One of the one of the things that we have to get over, I think, you know, if if we wanted to reconstitute Iraq, we can't sit around and talk about reconstituting Iraq as a democracy. We have to reconstitute it as an autocracy. So that leaves us with a very uncomfortable choice: is it going to be a Shia? autocracy run by Iran, or is it going to be a Sunni autocracy, essentially backed by the Saudis, but still, you know, having the Sunnis in some sort of, yeah, in some sort of charge? But um, if that's the case, then we, you know, 
there's going to be some sort of reckoning. There's going to be some huge amount of bloodshed on the ground there to try to determine this 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 situation. I, I and I can't see any Western leader putting their hand up to to do anything to put the pieces of Humpty Dumpty back together again in Baghdad. Mm. So even if we stick out the two years to try and get IS pushed back to a point where it's manageable, at what point after, say, the magical two-year number, do the two halves of Iraq start annihilating each other? Mm. So what are we there for? Are we there to get rid of ISIL because ISIL offends us, because ISIL has done terrible things to captives? Now, if that's our reason for going, at least have the guts to admit it. Mm. Mm. That our sole purpose for being there is you offend us. Yeah, that that's, makes sense to me. <laughs> ah, that, that behavior is offensive by our standards, yeah. but at least admit that's the only reason we're there, if that's why we want to be there. But the idea that we're somehow contributing to a stable state in the short to midterm future, how, where, prove it. Mm. I, th- I think that really the long, the short of it is, <clears throat> from how I see it, ISIL is really a political pawn in and of itself. Uh, its craziness is a craziness that's actually deliberately put onto the populations that they're that they're dominating at the moment, and it serves a strategic end. Um, whether or not you talk about you know potential Turkish involvement or potential Saudi involvement or potential anyone else's involvement in stoking those fires, it serves someone's end, and uh, and ultimately. If we could get rid of ISIS, and, or ISIL, I should say, and we did successfully get rid of them, the next question is, well, who's going to step up to the breach? Because once ISIL is finished as a strategic operator in that region, who's the next bad guy? Al-Nusra? Some other group that we don't even know about just yet because they're inhabiting the fringes of jihadism in the Middle East? You know, these are, these are complex issues, and I think that in the end, what we need is a, a firm commitment for a, for a diplomatic and political settlement, but I do not see that happen anytime soon. Because no matter what we do, it seems we don't ever confront the fact that there has been a vacuum in the Middle East for well over a decade now, and something or someone will always fill a vacuum. And in a place that has suffered so much repression... That vacuum is always going to be filled by an explosion of rage and old enmities. So here we are trying to keep states together that have been repressed for decades Mm. by external pressure. When the internal pressures are now unmanageable, and yet we're still playing the conventional map, conventional regime game, with people who've suffered Western interference from this since the early 20th century. It seems ridiculous that we think there can be a solution with current map lines. And as long as we keep thinking that, there's always going to be a vacuum there somewhere yep. for something like IS to fill, or as you said, the next variant. Yep. Yep. Well, on that very depressing note, that's a wrap for this week. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode and we look forward to your company again next week. Thanks to, our, uh, to producer Alicia Moreau and David Olney. And for now, goodbye from the Strategicon team. Mm-hmm.